when I curse Michael Byrne to sue. I am deliberately trying to work off my resentment, because I know that if it goes on turning bad inside, harm will come of it. As with Spratt, it is that element of calculation in it that shames me and makes it murder. He really thought he ought to be able to have you if he wanted you. Night, the recruiting centre for the inexhaustible army of shadows that make war on us. Something frightened him. I've always reveled in impersonal violence. She stood on a grave, poured paraffin over herself and set herself on fire. More than any other in my life, I have been the prisoner of two events. Striking a pregnant Joan, and that moment in Iraq. I think there might have been an accident. Hello, I'm Saul Wordsworth, author, musician, journalist, and son of former Fleet Street journalist Christopher Wordsworth, whose diaries are the subject of this podcast series. Welcome to the final episode of Devil in the Wilderness. We ended the previous episode with Emma the Transcriber informing me over email that... I thought you should know um, that on pages 43 to 44 of the attached, it seems that perhaps he killed someone. Someone. Suitably braced, I turned to the pages in question. There was another hour to darkness, and by then the tide would have turned. No one would visit the beach until tomorrow. Perhaps not then. The ebbing springs would not bear the body far and would deal gently with it in the dark. At about 11 o'clock, the tracks would be obliterated. The sand sucked and hissed and whispered the delicious word, life. He walked back beside the shore, scuffing the scum and detritus that fringed the high watermark. He climbed up the rock and over the fence into the field and after a brief hesitation, ducked and wormed away into the thickets of gorse. There he lay till it was almost dark, and he could no longer distinguish the body from the sand. Once he heard a gunshot, and a flock of curlew wheeled overhead and slanted away towards the mountains. If there was a dog on the sand, as the men with the gun were coming this way, there was little hope of the body escaping discovery. But when the second shot came after ten minutes, it was distant and muffled, like the thwack of a beaten carpet. And so it goes on. This is an abridged version of what's in the diaries. The specifics of the passage I don't think are important, though the act is. The protagonist is moving a body in the hope that it will be hidden or taken by the tide. Curiously, compared to the rest of his writing, it reads as rather lifeless and flat. Well, we know he suffered from writer's block. But why is it even here? I'm not sure I buy into Emma the Transcriber's hypothesis. After all, this isn't a confession. It's written as fiction. You could even say it's fanciful to draw a line to a killing or a murder, that it's too big a leap. But it is, at the very least, an interesting, curious and suggestive addition to journals already heaped with suggestion. What's additionally strange is that the pages around it are torn out and that across the five books, it's pretty much the only prose. Other than occasionally bringing together two excerpts, there's almost nothing I've changed about the diaries. What I have done, for clarity however, is use the word Iraq, when in fact often my dad has written 
Tanama or Tanuma, an area just to the north of Basra, the city where he was posted during the war. At Tanuma, as it's called, is a tiny area, a village on a river. According to maps and photographs, there are suggestions of a beach. So maybe, just maybe, my dad tried to hide or dispose of a body in At Tanuma, just outside Basra in Iraq. As I reached the end of the line with my research, I was on the brink of a hypothesis, a conclusion. But then I did one final sweep of the diaries and realised that there was something, or rather someone, I'd sort of forgotten about. My loss of judgement at Tanuma was almost as though I had been smoking or eating ganja. I wouldn't put that past Sprat at that. When I curse Michael Byrne to sue, I am deliberately trying to work off my resentment, because I know that if it goes on turning bad inside, harm will come of it. As with Sprat. So who is Sprat? Sprat is not someone I had heard of, and frankly, I hadn't known where to start. Unsure whether this person was a contemporary from school, at university, after university, or in the army, I had put out a couple of light feelers to rugby school and undertaken cursory Indian army research, neither coming to anything, so had kind of neglected the entries about Sprat. However, when revisiting the diaries, I properly took in the Ganja reference for the first time, one that clearly places Sprat in Iraq, in At-Tanuma, at the same time as my dad. And because of this, I went back through and found other references which, rather than existing in some nebulous moment in time, could now firmly be placed in Iraq, and possibly even the source of that moment moment in Iraq. The bull rage that I felt with Sprat, that I never want to feel again. But it was the rage of the Celadang, the Malayan bison, that holds its head high, that calculates and bides its time while the wound festers, not the turf-pouring head-down charge of the farm Hereford. It is that element of calculation in it that shames me and makes it murder. I should have hit him with an oar at midday, The word murder is underlined in the diaries. I don't think that murder in this context means murder, but that in its intent and cold calculation, whatever befell Sprat at my dad's hands was akin to murder. And whatever it was, it was worse than hitting a man with an oar, and at midday. But who was Sprat, and what happened to him? Back at the British Library, I found two Sprats who overlapped with my father's time in the Indian Army, D.N. Sprat and B.P. Sprat, and so, as with my father, requested their service files from the archives. So I don't have names, I have initials. Um, You've got the surname, haven't you? Yes, so they're both Sprat. Okay, thank you. Is it, is it double T? That's right, yeah. Thank you. It's a DN and a BP Sprat. Right, so these are the, of course, we have the Sprat, but none came up. I'm just going through the list. The, the service records are a series called IOR slash L slash mil slash 14. Yeah. So that's the reference we're looking for to see if we've got any. Right, so there's a couple of possibilities. They're not appearing. Okay. It could be that their service records are restricted. And if that's the case, if we have the service files, and if that's the case, they wouldn't appear on this catalogue. Okay. You would have to contact an archivist. Okay. To check if... Let me see if I can... As you're actually here, let me see if I can just read... Yeah, I'll just read someone and get them to do a search. Hi, John. Hello. John, could I, would it be okay if you could do an 
IOR Elmil 14 search for me, please. Thanks for the lot. It's Sprat, S P R A double T. nothing at all okay thanks a lot for looking thank you John no files at all Indian Army Service files for anyone with that surname fine okay. so I mean that just leaves a couple of options that if they were officers they should appear in the Indian Army lists which we have on the open access shelves I'll show you where it is um, I mean I found that that's how I found the their names with their initials. Yeah, in the Indian Army list. Yeah. Right, that unfortunately is all we're going to have. We don't have files for everybody. Right. We've got thousands of files, but unfortunately there's many that we don't have, many individuals that we don't have files for. Okay. It's, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's nothing. I, you no, know, I appreciate your help. Um, sorry. I emailed the chief archivist to try and understand what became of them, but he reiterated that not all records were kept. And so I reached the end of the line, whilst wondering idly whether my grandfather's clout and influence was enough to ensure that all files related to Spratt were somehow lost or buried. Based on the previous entries about Spratt, about things going bad and that element of calculation making it murder. It sounded like Spratt might have been both cause and effect, that his hostility may have provoked retribution from my dad that moment in Iraq, leading to a guilty conscience and a confession. But then there's this. I should be grateful to Spratt, Joan. I should class them together as enemies who have taught me the road, my road. Without them, I might be sweating over the annual estimates in Malaya. I might have known no anguish, no truth. Can you be grateful to someone you've killed? Surely that would be a stretch, even for my dad. But also there's this. India all the while rising, like a long-drowned corpse in my mind. Sprat. And this, on its own, out of nowhere. Sprat. On the wooden causeway. This one is certainly chilling, suggestive, because a causeway is most probably surrounded by water, like the village of Intanuma. Lastly, though, there's this. What started the chain reaction of disaster? Joan, father, Sprat? I presumed that the disaster was referring to that moment in Iraq. But maybe he means everything that followed afterwards. The arrival of Spratt in the narrative certainly queered my hypothesis pitch. We now have the presence of a hostile party, at least in my dad's view, and that dad meted out some kind of revenge, though this may not have been that moment in Iraq. It's unclear whether what my dad refers to as his loss of judgment in Iraq was dexterous or a more general loss of judgment in his actions, even a moral loss of judgment. Whatever happened, he then owns up or confesses to the crime. At hide and seek, I felt compelled to step out and reveal myself, the urge to own up, hence to Numa. His own father gets him off whatever charge might have been awaiting him, likely helps to hush it up and Dad is promptly shipped out of Iraq. But that didn't mean he was out of the woods, because should authorities ever find out what crime was committed, he could still be called to account. Which, in my view, explains the lack of mention or exploration of the moment in the diaries, and why some pages are torn out. There are things written in my own diaries I wouldn't have wished anyone to read, so they are heavily crossed out, a page removed, or a code employed. I am faced with a law if I tell the truth, and I am past the obligations of art. 
It is a battle for a moment of the attention of the conscience of the world. So what was that moment in Iraq? What, for example, are we to make of the reference in episode 4 to rape? And what is a moment? How long does it last? Surprisingly, there's an answer. 90 seconds, a definition dating back to the 8th century, though it's doubtful anyone today would see a moment as lasting that long. Moment is certainly an unusual word to use if describing a sexual assault. Unless, of course, you wish to minimise your own involvement or culpability, which I'm sure would have been the case. Certainly, for a man who made it his business to sleep with as many women as possible, 300 is the number cited more than once in the diaries, there may have been an occasion during this quest, a moment if you will, when he crossed the line in pursuit of what he calls possession of a woman. If so, he wouldn't be the only Wordsworth whose troublesome libido would get them into hot water. My dad's sister Joan, who was both doctor and Anglican nun, and not to be confused with his wife, Joan, suffered her own sexual disgrace when working in Africa in the 1950s, and as a result was no longer allowed to practice medicine while part of the sisterhood. Sister Frances Ruth, as she was called, would stay with us very occasionally. I'm sorry to say that she was a rather unpleasant, sour old lady, flirting with my grandfather, putting down my mother, and enjoying rather too much sherry. Around her, my dad was like a cat on a hot tin roof. Perhaps she knew the nature of his disgrace. She never shared hers with anyone. But I don't believe rape, if indeed there was a rape, to be the source of that moment in Iraq. Because of his aforementioned need to step Step out out and and reveal reveal myself, myself, the the urge urge to to own up, up, hence hence Numa. Numa. This moment sounds more like an incident or accident, where something has occurred and a name is required. The headmaster stood in assembly, demanding to know who sprayed graffiti in the squash courts at lunch. I think I told you on the phone I wondered if he'd had a motoring accident. Here's Eleanor Brooks, the backbone of the series, speaking to me from her bed, deep within the Kreuzer Valley, back in 2021 age 97. Whether he'd uh, been driving without a licence while in the army and had and somebody got killed in an accident and it could be seen perhaps as his fault and because he was in the army he got off, you know, was brushed under the carpet, something like that. I wondered if he had something like that on his conscience or was actually afraid of something catching up with him. Eleanor did indeed tell me on the telephone, because I recorded it. Hello? Eleanor, it's Saul again. Oh, yes? I was just curious, because I'd not heard this idea before. You talked about whether something had happened to Dad and that maybe it might have been related to driving. Yes. Where, Where did you get that from? Just his extreme sort of fear of driving. Right. So, so you think there might have been a connection? I think there might have been an accident, yes. Okay, interesting. But I never felt I found out the truth about his, his past. Yes, I, you, so if, I don't know. No. Will you be kind enough to ring me and tell me if you think you found uh, anything? It would interest me in the most um, disinterested way, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm not going to make anything of no. this story. He doesn't come in. <laughs> If you recall, driving has come up before. In episode one, my dad apparently using his car as a battering ram against college gates. To have known him, 
is to have encountered someone who for every possible reason, temperament, self-awareness, lack of awareness of others, could not have been less well suited to the responsibilities and requirements of driving. Despite owning a car as a younger man, my father had stopped driving abruptly in his thirties. This posed a problem as my mother didn't drive either. Despite her anxieties, she gamely learned in her late forties. At the same time, my dad, by then in his late sixties, also had some lessons. That is, until the instructor, Bruce, who, coincidentally or otherwise, suffered a series of breakdowns around this time, took my mum to one side and said, Christopher gets to a junction and just has no idea what to do. I'm sorry, but I just cannot teach him. When my mother imparted this news, as was so often the case, my father put it down to a conspiracy against him. Ten years later, aged 80, he reordered a provisional licence and asked me to take him out. Every time he did, I would change the subject until, well, eventually he died. So why didn't he drive? Whenever he was asked, whenever I asked him, he had his answer off pat. An experience of double vision during the war, he said. Yet something about this story never sat right. Who experiences double vision once? Also, his eyesight was startlingly good, 2020. And he only gave in to glasses in his 70s. It smacked to me of one of his simplistic, dismissive one-liners, but as ever with a hint of truth. I believe that the truth contained is that he was drunk, the double vision a euphemism for inebriation, enabling him to at least relay a partial reality. So what actually happened in that moment in Iraq? Whilst I can't prove my hypothesis, based on everything I know about my father, what others have told me, his track record for truths, his fear of driving, that he was a terrible driver, his plea of double vision, the entries and the clues in the diaries, it is my assertion that one night, while stationed in barracks in Attanuma, north of the city of Basra in Iraq, possibly drunk, possibly following an incident with Spratt, and very likely unhappy. My dad took an army jeep or lorry while under the influence, alone or with another, and that he crashed and killed someone on the road, or his passenger, the loss of judgment. Then, he either tried to hide the body, or more likely, fled the scene, only to come clean soon after. I cannot deny that Spratt on the causeway troubles me, but in terms of that moment, Spratt may even be a red herring, someone who goaded my dad, and then becomes, in my dad's mind anyway, the cause of that moment in Iraq. Because, along with rich food and the company of women, one thing my dad really loved to do was to hang the blame on anyone but himself. When I ran this theory by a couple of people who knew him, They agreed that a possible drunken misadventure behind the wheel sounded the most likely explanation. Based on all I knew, all I know, this is my assertion, my best guess, what I believe to be the best explanation for that moment in Iraq, that the weight of unhappiness to that point drove my father to a profound and deadly miscalculation. Whatever happened in that fateful moment, he never shared it with me or my brother David, or most likely his own brother Victor, possibly only with his own father, the secret going to the grave with both of them. But who knows, there may be a relative of Spratt who can shed light on whatever transpired between them. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast 
as anything I do discover or that comes to light will be disclosed in future bonus episodes. Despite the anxieties I may have felt around my father, my childhood was filled with plenty of fun and plenty of people. Of the adults, I always liked Dad's friends best, most of whom were from his years in Snowdonia, many popping up in this series. What a motley crew they were, likeable, often disreputable, but full of wit and entertainment, getting roaringly drunk at parties and lunchtimes. I recall many occasions when we'd been knocking on pub doors at 11, hoping they would open so a particular friend could sample their ale. Clearly a connoisseur, and nothing whatsoever to do with his rampant alcoholism. I certainly found them easier company than my mother's more successful, intellectually serious Cambridge friends. We would see a lot of Dad's friends when I was growing up, especially as almost all of our holidays were in Llanrada, Mid Wales, or very occasionally North Wales. But there may have been something about the bohemia of the Kreuzer Valley and the wilderness of Snowdonia as a whole that drew in the likes of my father, John Jones and Jeremy Brooks, men licking their wounds after the war, hiding out, or even those harbouring secrets, society's norms not quite reaching these extremities. Chris Oliver, one half of Oliver Earl from the Water Carnival, would visit us once or twice a year, and it was always a high point to find this charming, funny, lyrical presence in our home. Unfortunately, Chris Oliver had a weakness, a sickness, a crime. Here's Emma Pardo, until recently a resident of the Kreuzer Valley. I remember once going for a drink, on the, I don't know what we'd been doing, and we were sitting outside a pub, and we were both had a drink and we were chatting. I think we were coming back home from somewhere. And this young man walked by and I went to look and he'd gone. Chris had gone. He'd met this boy just by eyesight and then he disappeared for about three or four hours. Um, so there was always that, but I didn't... Because he was very charismatic. Very. And he was great fun. And he was very funny. I mean, when he went to work for Erica in that that primary school. But like, it's funny to think also, or oh, Erica, effectively, she was, in modern parlance, an enabler. Yes, but she was a Quaker and she was a great believer in for- forgiveness. I think she would have said that all her children were safe. Um, I mean, she and Malcolm used to sponsor paedophiles who came out of jail that she was kind of on the phone to them if they had any urges and things. I mean, she was an amazingly good woman. The term I heard growing up was seduced. But make no mistake, he raped the son of one of the families in this story. Strangely, bizarrely, they remained on good terms, continuing to have Chris Oliver to stay, right up until his death in the 90s. He was a fixture in our house when visiting from Marrakesh, where he'd moved after finally being blacklisted as a teacher in the UK, with my mum keeping a close eye on him when I was aged between 7 and 12. A couple of times I was aware of him paying me too much attention, but mum was never far away, and nor was adolescence, by which point I'd be out of the woods and he'd turn his attentions to another young sapling. What I felt was the norm, which was having this man as part of my landscape, whenever I mentioned it latterly to friends or family, they would be horrified. Mm, Yes. Yes, and I think it's quite difficult to to describe, because, I mean, I suspect if if he had been... Um, helped by Cyril in court he must have done something a bit yucky um, and I'm just in a way I'm closing my eyes to it because I did I did like him but um, I, I it's not acceptable and but there's nothing one can do about that that's the past yes I mean it is quite horrifying sometimes when you think of the 
Christopher Oliver really tried to persuade me that there was no harm in it. And here's Eleanor Brooks, hero of the hour. I thwarted him twice. With your own children, you mean? No, with other people's children. Well, when we had parties in the early days, when we all had young children, there used to be children and grown-ups mixed together. And Christopher Oliver was paying flattering attention to a boy whose parents I knew, and they didn't seem to be anywhere around to be seen. So I told him to stop. He was dancing with him and, as I say, paying him flattering attention. The child was wide-eyed. Mm. Uh, and then another time I stopped him and um, he said, but it's, you know, they like it, They want, that's what they want. What do you think, why do you think he... he um... Chris Oliver was a known quantity, but another member of the group, and another good friend of my dad's, harboured their own secret. A few years ago, having not received their traditional Christmas newsletter, I decided to Google this person. On doing so, I was presented with a police mugshot and an article. The man, whose name I shan't mention here out of respect for the family, had pleaded guilty to repeatedly abusing a boy 60 years earlier, apparently the longest period in British legal history between the crime perpetrated and the victim coming forward. I mentioned previously that this podcast is about consequences. Having watched a video of the survivor being interviewed on Channel 4 News, one gets a very visceral sense of the consequences such abuse can have. The last word, as ever, goes to Eleanor Brooks. That's sad. It's very sad. I guess Christopher Oliver persuaded him that it wasn't a bad thing to do. But he was a sportsman and I didn't think he was like that. Of course, he was a schoolmaster. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to have been much worse everywhere than we've thought. There's nothing to suggest that my father enabled either of these men, or even knew about the past of the second, but it does offer not only a flavour of the times, possibly even the area, certainly the freedom afforded those with authority, but also, sadly, how common such occurrences were, and very likely still are. As a child, I was present when my dad received a number of significant telephone calls. There was the death of Sue, which I covered in episode 3, and also his former lover Dorothy, who we would see often. After his own death, I found letters showing how dad had continued to pay for her phone and electricity well into his marriage to my mother. Then there was the call he took in the early 90s from the BBC asking if he'd appear on the 10 o'clock news to discuss the latest touring squad to India. His answer? Sorry, I don't do that kind of thing. Brought face to face with his inadequacies and limitations, he limped quietly and sadly up the stairs. It was painful to observe... Indeed, I've not really touched on my dad's self-consciousness, even shyness, which ran alongside, yet contrary to, his more outrageous, occasionally extrovert behaviour. It is significant that only in the case of sex did I override my psychopathic shyness to get what I was after, ploughing through the snubs and failures. It is also odd that shy as I was, I should have done such exhibitionist things. Growing up, though I didn't see myself as especially outgoing, Dad would occasionally express gratitude for, even marvel at, my relative confidence. Of course, alcohol is a means by which to reduce one's inhibitions. 
And whilst my dad loved a drink, a pint of pims each night to place, as he put it, a window between himself and reality, and keeping the pims in the fridge since it made up nearly half the drink. Unlike many others within the Kreuzer set, he never had a problem with drink, rarely drank to excess, always knew when to stop. I don't think I ever saw him truly, to use the modern vernacular, battered. He may, of course, have tempered things after that moment in Iraq, but he didn't appear to have the addiction gene. I'm not sure I do either, though for me, giving up drinking a few years ago was one of the very best things I've ever done. But I digress. Back to the telephone calls. I was there when the wife of Terry Kilmartin, Dad's former literary editor at The Observer, rang with the news that Terry had died and would my father come to the funeral? I'm sorry, but he betrayed me. Here's Miriam Gross, who worked under Terry and with my dad. He'll come to the funeral and I remember him saying I'm not going to come on the phone. Really? Because he was so cross with Terry? Because he was. Yeah. That's really bad of him. I well, know. I, I... But, it, but that shows you how it, thin the skin and how... I know how, how... Yes, 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 yes. Interesting, isn't it? Yes. Oh, dear. Such bitterness, such sadness, such as my mother had it, an injustice collector. I was also there when the then Observer editor, Donald Trelford, called to tell my dad that sorry, but no, he would not be receiving a pension. Of course he wouldn't. He may have been a weekly Observer contributor for more than 30 years, but he was only ever a freelancer. Yet my dad, in all his innocence, even entitlement, was left furious, let down, betrayed. His standard position. Bitterness comes about always from not receiving a little more than what is given. I was there for endless phone calls with friends, where Dad was threatened to abandon the friendship due to some perceived slight or cut. When he died, I came across a cache of unfinished letters, the tone all too familiar, a kind of breeziness whilst pulling the trigger. But the friends always came back, or he did except in the case of cricket broadcaster John Arlott, with whom he had a terrific falling out, and which he would mention with sadness and righteousness. I was also, often, in the room when he would dictate his completed copy down the phone to what were known as copy takers, and who, for longer than I'd like to admit, I thought were called coffee takers. This was certainly far cheaper than getting your piece couriered to Fleet Street by taxi, though it did mean my being regularly subjected to his own homespun version of the phonetic alphabet. N for nuts. N for nuts. U for D umbrella. For Dominic, T for, for Thomas. T S Thomas, for sugar. V Full for stop. Thomas. Capital M for mother. O for other. V for Victor. U for umbrella. E for elephant. Comma. R for Richard. Of course, phoning in your piece can cause its own problems, especially when you're forced to relay it down the phone from a busy press box or nearby call box after a rugby or cricket match. Mistakes are inevitable, such as the time Dad pointed out that the two teams he had been watching would be doing battle again the following Saturday in the self-same arena, the last few words appearing in the paper as the Selsey Marina or his reference to the Countess of Eyre, that had morphed in the pages of The Guardian into the County Surveyor. Regardless of any praise that came his way, and there was plenty, he was regarded by some as the finest rugby writer of his generation, a highly respected cricket writer and an excellent, reliable reviewer. I still occasionally come across his name on the backs of novels. My dad didn't believe that what he was doing was of any great consequence, which is why I can find more of his reviews and sports reports on the internet than in the bundles of miscellany he left behind. He saw reviewing as a lesser form, but stuck with it. Remarkably, after decades of very little, he sprang to life, a 
a spot-changing leopard and work flat out for 30 years to give the three of us as good a life as possible. Unfortunately, the work he was required to do, particularly for the literary pages, became a breeding ground for his resentment. Here's Blake Morrison, author and former Observer colleague who appeared in the previous episode. Blake offers insight into both my dad's talents, but also the tasks he would undertake that may have led his bitterness to fester. I, I met Christopher when I was working on The Observer. I was the deputy literary editor working with Terry Kilmartin, who was the great boss and who was obviously very fond of Christopher. Our big day was a Wednesday when we would sub the copy and design the pages and Christopher would, would come in uh, mid-morning probably and he had one important task. He had to devise headlines. So he would sit there, he would read the various pieces, there'd be eight or nine pieces maybe, and his job was to supply as many as 10 possible headlines for each, some short, some long, because we didn't know quite how many words we need and so on. And, you know, he had a real talent for, for, witty, for witty headlines. Um, and then, you know, by 12.30 or so, he'd probably have done the work and by one we went to the pub <laughs> yeah you felt there was there was an ambition um, a stifled ambition to him because the only writing he was doing for the book pages was was about thrillers was very short crime fiction reviews he didn't get to do the bigger stuff so you know he'd be thinking up headlines for pieces by Anthony Burgess and so on but his own crime fiction shorts were were you know submitted once a month and had a fairly lowly place on the pages so there was that sense of he was he should have been doing greater things and he didn't talk about you know ambitions beyond the paper and and writing he was doing but th there was that sense of a, a man who lived an interesting life and had had grand ideas for what he might do and he was yeah a bit a bit disappointed and a bit unkempt with it all really <laughs> It was that romantic bohemian air of a man who was doing this almost as a favour to the paper because he could have been doing greater things. And on the other hand, I think Terry Kilmartin was doing him a favour because, you know, this was a day's, a day's work, a day's pay. He probably paid for a full day and did a couple of hours. Um, and, you know, he, he was in need of, my understanding was he was very much in need of the work and, and the, the cash. Back to Miriam Gross, my godmother, who was Observer Deputy Literary Editor prior to Blake Morrison, and with whom my dad fell out to the point where her name was never mentioned in our house. He did very nice reviews. They were never very long because, in fact, it, it was rather unfortunate because short reviews were what all literary editors want. They want to people doing short reviews because most reviews are short and there are only two big, in those days anyway, only two big reviews or possibly three a week and all the others are short. And so Christopher was a little bit exploited because he was quite willing to do short reviews and he was rather good at it and he knew a lot of things about, he knew a lot about a lot of things. He was very, very knowledgeable. Different things, sport on the one hand, boxing, you know, um, Agriculture seemed to know a lot about literature. He knew, knew knew a lot about you know. So he was a very polymathic. So he was very useful for literary editors. But he, he became a bit unhappy because he well, a you didn't make so much money if you read shorter reviews, and although they're more difficult, like short letters, it's more yes. difficult. Um, but also he he became. To, came to feel sort of a bit underrated and under underappreciated. And I think he was quite right. And I think my boss did slightly exploit him because he was very, very useful to Terry Martin. I often tried to um, encourage Terry to commission longer pieces from Christopher, but, but he very rarely did it, partly because it is true to say that Christopher's style was not very easy to read. I mean, he was very good at imagery and so like almost too good, so that it was slightly clogged his prose. So that's not very good for journalism. I don't blame him at all because he was a very gifted man, but somehow wasn't suited actually to journalism all that much. Maybe he was suited to, to, to sport reporting, which he did well, but for book reviewing, 
he was both very good at it and also unsatisfactory. It is a, a difficult situation. With no other outlet to show the world just how talented he was, I can see how my dad might tend towards cramming too much in. Indeed, Wordy's pieces. He was often known as Wordy, as am I, as I'm sure is anyone called Wordsworth, tended increasingly towards the verbose, leading him to appear not once, but ten times in one year in Private Eye's Sood's Corner, a spot for readers to send in the most pretentious-sounding material they found in print that week. Last but not least, here's Peter Crookston, friend and observer colleague, who appeared briefly in the previous episode, with whom I spoke at Elvino's, the great hub of Fleet Street life, and who introduces a second weekly pub outing, this time with the sports desk. And at the helm, Clifford Makins, observer sports editor and the original legend in his own lunchtime. Well, every Tuesday, after the, the Tuesday morning conference, Clifford Makins would adjourn to Elvino's with his deputy, Hugh McIlvanny, with your father, and with one or two other contributors from the sports pages. And I would join them because I was the picture editor. So I became a very privileged member of the Clifford Megan's court. And he did hold court. Peter went on to describe how at lunch the likes of sports writing legend Hugh McIlvenny and my dad would take it in turns to buy bottles of champagne and how my dad wouldn't speak so much, but that his one-line interjections would often be the most memorable moments from such meetings. Latterly on the sports desk was Julie Welch, the only female football writer on Fleet Street at the time, who describes my dad as a gent and a raconteur, and her husband, fellow sports writer Ron Atkin, who recalls a time dad got very, very drunk. So drunk, he told me via email that he crawled under a bush and lay there, whimpering. As he approached his 80th year, my dad seemed to undergo something of a transformation. Gone was most of the ferocity. Not that he was happy about getting older, losing his powers, including, dare I say it, his sexual powers. Coincidentally or otherwise, this was the period when he started buying guns. My half-brother David and I once found him in a field in Hanrayada, lining up his air rifle to shoot a bull in the balls. Thankfully, we were able to wrestle a gun off him, but it doesn't take Sigmund Freud to interpret the metaphor. On another occasion, mortifyingly one when I had a friend over, we had started pudding and my mother aimed the squirty cream that was all the rage back in the 1980s at her dish, but missed, sending the cream firing across the table. My dad surveyed the results and remarked, I wish I could do that. Yet despite his advancing years, the book talk lived on in his conversation a threat here, a reminder there. His final great excuse for not putting pen to paper was played out upon my mother, whom he gradually wore down, or, depending on your point of view, bullied into submission. How can I remain in Harpenden and write tomorrow? What had begun as a trickle in the 1980s turned into a deluge by the 90s, until, in 1996, my dad, 81, and my mum, 61. They sold their house in Harpenden and moved to Hanrade in Mochnant in Powys, mid Wales, the village where we would spend every summer when I was growing up. Um, so where, where are we? We are in Hanrade in Mochnant, which is a little village uh, that I used to come to. Felt like pretty much every holiday from the age of about zero to 17, 18. It's uh, where my parents finally moved to. 
It's where my dad loved to fish. He uh, loved to fish the River Tanat. The, the Tanat Valley runs through here. I'm named after the Tanat. It's, it's a middle name of mine. Um, and it's, it's absolutely f- jam-packed with memories. There's the Winstay Arms Hotel. The Winstay Arm Hotel, I see it's called there, which is where I was introduced to the son of Augustus John, Casper John, formerly um, First Sea Lord who had no legs and I was about six years old and I was terrified of him. And uh, I used to play out in the garden, out in the back with my friends Mungo and Hunya. I, had, I even had a kind of social life set up for me down here. I remember going on school trips when I was here. I used to be pulled out of school early to come on holiday for the whole summer here um, because my dad would spend six weeks here every summer fishing and reviewing many hours spent in the Wednesday my dad always ordering two bottles of Pilsner and pouring them into a pint glass I mean I've got quite a vivid memory of standing in the car park in San Riva in the centre of the village in the summer of 1982 um, the summer that my dad had a heart attack while he was up here and us all standing there in the rain and saying our goodbyes and it being a rather muted affair my dad looking a lot thinner than he'd looked two weeks previously when he'd had the heart attack and he'd spent you know, a week in hospital with hospital food and probably lost a lot of much needed weight and I think I was rather placated that holiday with uh, a Spanier 82 stickers because I was collecting Panini stickers for the World Cup that summer and so uh, was, was that get, Spain or was it yeah. Italy? No, that was Spain. Spaniard 82. So I think I was, you know, because my dad had just had a heart attack, I got more than my share of stickers than I might have done otherwise. Aged 23, I helped them move up there. But despite dad's daily suggestion that I should get a job with the forestry and make their new home my home, I moved back to the southeast, initially to St Albans then on to London. But I would visit, never for more than a long weekend, but often enough, and would always depart wondering whether this would be the last time I would say goodbye to my dad. And then they moved down. And then they moved down here. And they moved to the old vet's cottage called Hluinon. Should we, uh, should we go to Hluinon? I don't actually know which one that they would regard as the front door anymore because people always used to knock at the back. There's someone hiding behind the door. I definitely heard movement. No, there might have just been the shed door. So this was... This was where my parents moved in the summer of 96. Euro 96. I remember watching some of the football here with my dad. Um, oh, it's a front, is that the front mm. door there? Maybe, maybe. Well, let's have a go here as well. These are all new windows. And that is the room. That's the room where I confronted my father about his behaviour when I was growing up. It was probably a few months before he died and he looked completely shell-shocked. He had no idea of the effect that he'd had on me. He mellowed tremendously. That's the voice of his friend Ivan Nottingham. You'll also hear his wife, Bill's voice, Dad's former lover. When we met him, his little black beard stuck up and then the crab yeah. as it went the <laughs> These were easier, better years, for me at least. The edge, the fight, had mostly left my dad. He'd still get into rages, but more often than not, mid tirade, would stop and laugh, recognising the ridiculousness of it all. I don't think my mother, 
a city bird, was ready to settle into retirement in a small Welsh village, but she acquiesced to his demands, and after an unsettled period, began to show signs that she too would embrace their new life in Wales. Within a few months, however, she'd received a fairly devastating diagnosis. Yet even though this news was difficult for everyone, my father seemed, generally speaking, more at peace than I'd ever witnessed him. By now, the novel talk had all but dried up, though it would still make a very occasional appearance. Towards the end of his life, I asked him what, in fact, it was, or had been, about. His response... It's a novel about a man trying to write a novel. ...is, I think, telling, and the classic way for a writer with writer's block to approach his subject. So why was my father unable to produce the great novel, or even a novel? Clearly, he could write like a dream. This is what Ivor Nottingham said to me back in 2005. It's worth bearing with the audio quality. And Christopher, when we'd had drink and things, I got the impression that Chris, unless it was going to be better than Tolstoy, was not going to risk putting it down. It's a form of uh, or right I, I, block. I was going to say, I, I, I saw the writer's block there. That he um, knew that he could produce something great, and yet he, something stopped him from doing it. Writer's block, yes, that much we know. Of more interest is what's behind it. I think, you know, cups I once said, because you've got to... You're, yeah, you're a scholar and I got a first class mind. And Chris said, No, I haven't. I'm, I've got a second class mind. Um, I remember those words. Whatever class it was, it was about 25 classes of mind. <laughs> Whatever class of mind my dad had, there's little question he also had an extraordinary facility with words and the recollection of them. My writing complicated by a search for words and descriptions that I have filed for reference over the last twenty years. An extraordinary attic, my mind, of literary incunabula and trash, of half-coherent ideas, wisps of learning, borrowed phrases. Remember, too, that like his own father, he had, or had something approaching, a photographic memory, something I would witness regularly, reeling off poetry he'd read once, 30 years previously. Here's Professor Ray Monk from episode three. He recited Vachel Lindsay's poem, The Congo, off by heart, which is quite a feat because it's a long poem. Just because you have a facility for language and the ability to recall entire passages, it doesn't necessarily follow that you have imagination, can create character or plot. Such gifts are not necessarily synonymous with creativity. One might even say they are counter-gifts, like the idiot savant, born with extraordinary natural abilities, along with pronounced shortcomings or deficits in other areas. In the end, though, perhaps it was his self-absorption, the inability to look beyond the self, cited by so many in this series, that ultimately got in the way. What I am fighting more than anything is this self-obsession, because I find my thoughts are stunted by it. It atrophies my attempts to construct character or incident, and it is too late now to understand people. And that would lead to an endless search for someone or something to blame, when over the course of a lifetime, failure to write a novel can only ever come down to one person, the writer, or writer Monke. Failed writer, as Dad would sometimes describe himself, Monke from the French, by definition failed or fallen short, especially because of circumstances or a defect of character. It seems to me that I have earned my right to dream and dawdle, that it is at the heart of my self-respect, something that I cannot now relinquish and survive.
It is a cast of mind and attitude to life that is compounded of books I have read, of protective fantasy, of a determination not to compete. It contains my thinking about my father and my mother. It has the defects of my youth in it, and all the endless shifts by which, when I sought to hide them from others, I was living them for myself. Calf loves, calf lusts, the sad start up the blind alley, the medlar tree, the stinging and the cold, the peaks of Rarotonga, the ill-timed word, the ill-starred act, the corner boy of literature. In musical terms, you might say my dad was an expert session musician, technically gifted beyond compare, but for whatever reason, in the end, maybe not a songwriter. We all have our strengths. The irony is that While since my early battles with my dad, I've not been a great reader of fiction and lack his aptitude for language, I cannot stop writing or creating. Stories, music, short films, even this series. The sheer joy, freedom and pleasure of creation never once shows itself in the diaries. Only self-laceration for not managing to create. I'm in desperation and I've practically given up on the book. There are 12 pages written and I sit before them every morning, day after day, for the last two months and cannot add a sentence, add a word. When I face that fated manuscript, it seems to me that I have forgotten how to think. Worse, how to write. It is as if something in my head has given way to let in a cold, grey mist. This is Lucia Jones daughter of the communist farmer John Jones, and still resident in the Kreuzer Valley. But that was the story of Christopher in a way. He was full of promise and potential and not, you know, didn't, didn't actually get it together in the end, you know? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, but in a way, this is me getting it together for him. Yeah. It? Clearly, at some point in the past, there was a book to be written. Increasingly, it acted as a kind of crutch, propping the door ajar through which hope could stream. As he writes in Underdogs, I succumb from time to time to the comforting theory of the last laugh. What is the great unwritten novel but the threat of the last laugh, a comfort blanket against mediocrity, the pipe dream that sustains the dreamer? I found this entry in his diaries, two lines copied out from a poem by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, that really says it all. Look in my face. My name is Might Have Been. I am also called No More. Too late. Farewell. On October the 15th, 1998, my dad rose early, as he often did, headed out to survey the River Tanat, then made a plan with a new arrival in the village, someone who, like him, had been raised in Calcutta, to fish for trout the following week. After breakfast, he cadged a lift with a friend to nearby Ossestry, buying up an assortment of savoury delicacies at a deli across the road from the house he chaired with his Aunt Maggie 40 years previously. He returned at midday and had lunch with my mother before she went upstairs to rest and he took up his usual position in the sitting room in front of the telly, turned on the golf and opened a book he was reading for a non-urgent review for the good book guide, knowing full well that sleep wouldn't be far away. That afternoon, I was at work in St Albans when my phone rang. It was my aunt. She said, I think Christopher might be dead. I can still hear myself shouting no, my legs buckling as I stood. The colleague in the bathroom who asked, how's it going? To whom I responded, not great, my dad's just died. Who replied, good one, and sauntered off. An afternoon nap with mum upstairs resting. She came downstairs and 
and found him dead in the chair. That would have been a shock. Yeah, yeah. it would have been a terrible shock for her. Even though he was 83, it was still out of the blue, it was very sudden. And she was unwell herself, and it was a real body blow. She was just, just beginning to regain an element of her health. And uh, yeah, it really, it hit her very hard. She was already... His funeral was held in Welshpool the following week. I escorted my now frail mother down the aisle, tears streaming down my face, me apparently powerless to stop them. I recall little of the day, a wooden fish carved by a local man and left on the coffin, chatting with Debbie, daughter of Dad's old girlfriend Dorothy, about how much he'd helped her with her A-levels, that some mourners arrived late and missed the funeral due to an error in the leaflet mailed out by the funeral directors. Affection for my dad, often accompanied by a knowing smile. The following week, the obituaries appeared. His wasn't a famous name, but newspapers always look after their own. Perhaps the most amusing didn't surface until April the following year, in the 136th edition of Wisden Cricketer's Almanac. Christopher William Vaughan Wordsworth. He died on the 15th of October 1998, aged 83. Epitomised the breed of eccentrics who used to report county cricket for the posher Sunday newspapers. In his younger days, he was an adventurer who tried to eke out a living in Wales by his skill as a fly fisherman. Later, he eked out an even more precarious living reviewing books for The Guardian and The Observer. On Saturdays, he would write erudite and literate reports on rugby or cricket, dictated in a booming voice and was a familiar, shambling figure on the county circuit, liked by his colleagues, except by those who remember him as the man who broke the only phone at Horsham. A few months later, my mother sold the house in Wales and moved in with her own mother in Golders Green, North London. She died three years later, aged 66. For a long time, I had both sets of ashes under my bed. I'd never talked to them. I think I just liked having them around. My dad had always said he wanted his scattered on the River Tannet. Perhaps my final act of defiance was to deny him this. But I felt like I needed them in one place. Eventually in 2003, I got round to arranging their burial in the Brith Deer, a hillside above Llanrada, just up from Mavis Nicholson's house. And as of 2022, the four of them can now be found only a few yards apart from each other. Mavis and Jeff, my mum and my dad, no doubt bickering. Sadness. It's poignant. It is poignant, of course, but it's a long time. It's a long time ago now. Um, I just wish I could have had more time with them both. And whilst putting my parents in the ground had felt like a last goodbye, I had one final emotional journey to undertake. The journey into my dad's diaries. My attitude to life has always been that of a traveller between trains at some splendid desert junction, where the only thing to do is drink the warm whiskey and watch the parakeets. These days, I try not to judge my dad. When you're in pain, whatever the source of that pain, it can be hard to look beyond the self. I'm certain I've been guilty of the same. So I try to have compassion for him, and dare I say it, for myself.
One of the more noteworthy things about my dad was that terrific third programme voice. As Jeremy Brooks had it in the Water Carnival, the third programme being the old name for BBC Radio 4. It was most certainly RP, received pronunciation, but something more, something richer, more lyrical, a resonant bass with a hint of menace. And yet, not a single recording survives, no copy of the reel-to-reel tape his friend John Earle made at one of those drunken parties on the estuary, where in the pitch black, my father can apparently clearly be heard saying, Whose arm is this? Before I break it. No searchable archive of the recording he made for the World Service in the late 80s of Rudyard Kipling, which his friend Chris Oliver heard beamed over his radio in Marrakesh, and and which brought him to tears. For the wind is in the palm trees and the temple bells, they say. Come you back, you British soldier. No evidence of the audio interview my parents' friend Magda Hall subjected him to in the 1980s as part of her psychology thesis, knowing that by using my dad as a subject, she couldn't help but secure full marks. Nor the endless snippets of conversation I would capture with my first tape recorder, only later to record over with the top 40. The only trace is this, me playing a synthesizer in the living room, my parents talking in the background, my mother's tones, something about cake, barely audible, my father's, even less so. There's almost nothing, but I've slowed it down for you. Almost nothing, but I feel his presence. During this process, there was a recurring joke between myself and executive producer Paul. Because you see, almost every time I interviewed someone, they would die often soon after I spoke with them. It happened with Mavis Nicholson and with Eleanor Brooks. It happened with Phila de Barlow from episode two. And when I reached out to Donald Trelford, I was told he was gravely ill and he died soon after. I would warn Paul about the curse of the podcast and that we needed to watch our step. It almost felt like some of these wonderful, generous people had stuck around long enough for me to capture their thoughts before they finally shuffled off. Of course, when interviewing friends and acquaintances of someone who died 25 years ago, aged 83, much of this is inevitable. But then it happened with Emma Pardo, literally a couple of weeks after I visited her. Emma was in her early 60s. I hadn't seen her for ages, and it was so great to catch up. And like everyone who appeared in this series, she was so generous with her time so thoughtful and considered in her answers, often telling me new things. I can remember when you were at university and you did, um, you did some busking and everyone kept it a, a secret from your father. There was this thing, don't let, don't let Christopher know, don't mention it in front of Christopher, um, because he would have gone ballistic or, you know. But did he find out in the end? I, I had uh, no idea about yes, that. Yes, no, I remember that. There was a, probably it was a, a remark like, well, don't mention it. Emma had very recently given up Garigvar, the house her mother Pauline and stepfather Cyril had rented off the Clough estate. With the death of Clough Williams Ellis in 1978, aged 94, the policy of offering cottages to arty English connections in the Kreuzer Valley stopped abruptly, and in recent years has been deliberately reversed, with only Welsh speakers now allowed to stake a claim for a cottage. There's every chance that, with Eleanor Brooks's death, an era has truly passed. There was, though, one person I worried about, the person I loved the most who appeared in this podcast, my brother David Wordsworth. David died on the 13th of April 2023, me on the way up the A1M, trying to catch him before he went. 
He was, strictly speaking, my half-brother, and thirty years my senior. But to me, he was only ever my brother, and we were extremely close, even more so in the last few years. And he was my only real connection to our father, and me for him. Though that's changed somewhat as a result of this process, my having become better acquainted with my cousins on the Wordsworth side. David had come so close to not reconnecting with our dad. It was only at the suggestion of his late sister Diana, who had already met up with him, telling David he should meet him too, as he liked nice food. Against his better judgement, he went along, and though theirs was always a tricky relationship, ours, which spanned my whole life until his death, was filled with so much joy, and so very, very many laughs. I didn't, I didn't think about children, but maybe yes, maybe that came into as well. You don't have to commit if somebody's married, do you? Uh, it's my interview. You know it's a And so, dearest bro, this series is dedicated to you. And here he is again, one last time, with a few final thoughts, followed by a handful of others. And lastly, well, I guess there's only one person who should get the final word. Me, Dad. Only joking. His best qualities were... Um, he was a good raconteur, based upon... Um, a wealth of experience, and his worst quality was that probably none of that was true. <laughs> People liked him, but he so often spoiled it. I do remember Cyril saying he was a bit outraged that your father, very pleased with himself, had said to him, well, I've arranged it so Tamara won't be able to leave um, Clamrada. And I don't know what he meant by that, but I think he'd meant either that there wasn't enough money or somehow she wouldn't be able to return to uh, Harpenden, yes. You mean in the event of his death? Yes. I remember Cyril saying to Pauline he did think it was a bit much that. <laughs> but I think and I don't know what it means, well, actually. Well, I quite like that because yeah. it, it suggests that the devil yes. <laughs> remains until the end. Yes, yes, yes. As I say, it was a lovely story of, uh, of going up the hill on a bicycle with all the little kids shouting, Moustache Dial, and Dial is devil, bearded devil, moustached devil. What's most amazing in that whole story is the idea of dad on a bike. <laughs> For me, <laughs> that's quite something. Essentially, we do not change, not at the root and trunk of the tree. We may seem to change, evolve, progress or backslide, to be whipped by this wind, to proliferate in this sun. But when our fruits, by which it is said we are known, lie scattered around the bowl, we are as we were, the wicked that have flourished, the good that have failed, we are as we were, entirely immutable. Palladian, as we were conceived in the brain of creation. Devil in the Wilderness was written, produced and presented by me, Saul Wordsworth. Original music from the series, such as this track, is also by me and is available on Spotify. Links in the show notes. The executive producer was Paul Kobrak. The voice of my father was performed by Chris Porter actor, voiceover artist, and a school friend who knew my dad. Other voices in order of appearance in this episode are Sophie Herxheimer, Rob Jones, and George Whitwell. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future 
bonus episodes, including anything that might come to light regarding Sprat. A link to images of people from this series will appear in the show notes. This track, along with the outro track from episode one, was mixed and mastered by Eric Homburg of K51 Studios in Stockholm. Prior to the possession of a woman, that moment, full of trepidation, glorious uncertainty in which the heavens poise, like the moment of strapping on one's box in the pavilion, one's fingers shaking a little, the buckskin cool and the shirt and the loins hot and a little moist, the desultory clapping as the incoming batsman nears the steps, the self-conscious adjusting of the glove as he strides out into the deafening summer,